Hi, my name is Dylan O'Donnell and I'm an astrophotographer. And I am a space simp, a simp for space. I have a problem. I spend way too much money on equipment, big telescopes, backyard observatory, cameras with refrigerators on the back of them, all to tease out slightly more revealing photos of space. And I hope I get more revealing photos of space, considering all the money I give her. Every year, the same stuff goes around in the sky as the Earth orbits. And every year, I feel compelled to keep shooting that stuff over and over, deeper and deeper, to get the best possible images I can. But there's one region of space which really just leaves me confused. Every time I look at the photo, I can't really figure out what I'm looking at. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's truly the weirdest thing I've seen in space. So stay with me and I'll tell you all about this photo. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. <laughs> My dad was a graphic designer. Long before computers, uh, everything was hand-drawn and hand-illustrated. And I remember he used to finish a work and then at the end of the day, he would sit on the couch and open a beer and plop that work in front of him and really look, and I mean really look, he would sit there and stare at the image. He really was taking in what he'd done. Now, in hindsight, it's possible that he was just an alcoholic and uh, he just needed me to shut up so he could look at what he'd done. But it always stuck with me the way he looked at his work. And because I spend hours and days producing these images, when I finish them, I really do stop and look at them. Uh, it's very easy to get into the trap as an astrophotographer of just kind of chasing the best stars, and the best looking processes, and you kind of forget about what we're doing, looking at space. So I make a point of when I finish an image, sit back and really take in what I've captured. Now, normally I would give you blue ball by showing you a montage of the process and really build up the hype until I show you the photo at the end with some emotional music to really hijack that emotional gravity. But I'm gonna skip all that montage and go straight to the photo that I've captured. So here is the emotionally manipulative music. Wait, 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 we need uh, war drums for this. What the actual f is this? It's called Corona Australis, which is cool because it's named after my country, but it literally translates to Southern Reef. Uh, you see the reef there? It kind of looks like coronavirus, hence the name Corona Australis. Now I've used no filters to capture this image. This is a true color image. This is what you see with a normal color camera. You see that brown smoke? This is carbon monoxide. There is hydrogen in there as well, molecular hydrogen, but for the most part, there's a lot of carbon monoxide in here. Now, if you follow me on Instagram or here on YouTube, you've seen Nebula before, uh, and we always say the same thing, right? They're normally red and glowing, they're emission nebulas, and we say the same thing about star formation. These are stellar nurseries, and they kind of all work the same way. They turn dust and gas into new stars. From nebula come stars, from stars come planets, and from planets come moons. And from all of that comes life, we assume, at least statistically. But looking at this image, I can't immediately say the same thing. For a start, it's a dark nebula. It's not bright and glowing like the other nebula I photograph. It's really inactive, at least from a stellar wind perspective. And look at the stars. Do you notice anything? In other star-forming regions, it's filled with obviously new, hot, young stars, glowing blue. You can even make out where they've scooped out the dust or gas and been shot into space like semen out of a dusty pillar of creation. Okay, so here we've got the two NGCs and another one down here. Um, but there's some weird stuff going on. I mean, we can see some of these new blue stars. These are actually two stars, and each one of those are a binary. And you can see where it's been scooped out. Uh, you can see the remains of the stellar material that was probably used here to create these guys. These guys are basically stellar twins. The, the spectrotype's almost exactly the same. These guys are young, dumb, and full of hydrogen. But no stellar emissions here. Uh, this is just a reflection nebula. Now, I think some of the clue lies in here. You see this guy, SCRA. Uh, clearly, 
there's been a scoop of material out of here, but it hasn't created a hot new blue star. It's created a very young T Tauri star. This star is low mass, which is why it's not as bright and doesn't have the energy. In fact, I suspect a lot of the stars through here are just simply made that way. They're not made as hot young blue stars. They're made as low mass orange stars. Now, another striking feature of this region is the amount of extinction that happens with the dust cloud. The stars plotted here are from other NASA missions. They're not just the ones that are detected in my image. So these are all the stars we know about, the stars we can see. And you can see even NASA missions can't see through this cloud. It's like a void through here, which is incredible. And more weirdness just goes on and on. I mean, look at this tiny patch of nebula here, but it's so small, I have to suspect that maybe there's some sort of protostar activity down here as well. And of course, a lot of the action is completely hidden from us, so we can only really study this in X-rays. But it doesn't look to me like there's any shortage of material here to be making big stars. So why don't we just get these little orange, low mass, low energy ones? The other weird thing about this region is where it is. We see nebula in galaxies really quite close to their host galaxies. They're all peppered all the way through. Most of the nebula we see are along the galactic plane. They're very obviously in the Milky Way. Uh, here in the Tarantula Nebula, we see the Southern Magellanic Cloud, and it's one of the nebulas in that galaxy. The Milky Way is filled with these glowing red areas where stars are being formed and their emissions are causing the hydrogen to glow. But really, just like the Northern Lights. We see nebula glowing in other galaxies because that's where the action is. That's where nebula happen. But Corona Australis is way over here. It's just by itself floating 18 degrees away from the Milky Way. It's forever alone, a bit like you. Nebula like this that glow blue instead of red are called reflection nebula. And there's one other region that this reminds me of, and that's the Pleiades. It's also a cluster of stars that has clearly used up its big dust cloud for these hot new young stars and it's now just floating around, shining light on what's left of the cloud. In fact, both of these nebula are roughly the same way away from us. And also, both of them are a little way away from the Milky Way proper. Did the Pleiades used to look like Corona Australis? This nebula and its clouds are filled with secrets. And by using different spectra, NASA and ESA can peer through the clouds to show there are some young stars here. And there is star formation. but even though it's said to be as active as Orion, even looking through the clouds reveals a few dozen young stars and the blue hot ones we do see in the main image are really, really young. They're just forming in fact, but proto star formation. It's just like it's the very beginning of this process. The young stars that are there are also variable stars. They're pulsating, which means the light changes. So if you photograph this region over time, you're gonna see those bright clusters grow and shrink depending on the light that these stars are giving out. It's a very dynamic nebula in this sense, unlike the other nebula we normally photograph, which is really gonna be the same from year to year, at least on our timescales. The molecular cloud isn't just carbon though, and it's not just a little bit of hydrogen. It's really quite rich. It has everything you need to create a new world. It has formaldehyde, methanol, cyan, cyan, cyan and not going to work here anymore, cyanide, hydrogen cyanide, silicon monoxide and much more. Studies of the cloud's motion indicate that at one time it was zooming through space like just which is freaking weird right just zooming through space by itself and then it hit our Milky Way and shot through the other side but way slowed down so it's really slow relatively speaking compared to everything else. In fact, it's only going at seven kilometers a second, which sounds fast. That's actually only half as fast as the New Horizons spacecraft, which is zipping out of the solar system as we speak. But something happened when it hit the Milky Way. This is probably what triggered its initial round of star formation and these new blue ones here. It's not like a nebula that's naturally within the galactic plane rotating around the massive black hole in the middle as stellar material is whipped around and mixed up. It's only through crashing into the Milky Way that this star formation has probably been triggered. We are looking at somewhere that likely doesn't have any life. It's dead, but only because it's just beginning. Stars are just beginning to form, but it's only just stopped being a clump of gas and dust that will now become plasma and dirt. Having pierced through our galaxy and out the other side, it's both full of potential and absolutely barren. Thanks for watching me wax lyrical about the weirdest thing that I've ever photographed through my telescope. Much of the information I've discussed has come from Kniep and Webb's brilliant Annals of the Deep Sky 
series. They're only up to volume seven and they're only up to C. I really hope they don't die before they finish this series. It's very good. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested. For the astrophotography nerds who are watching me and want to know about the image, it took you know, about four or five sessions outside, but of those sessions, I only used the best three hours of data. It's taken in three minute exposures using both the ZWO1600MM, but all that beautiful natural color is from the QHY268C. And again, no filters at all, both on the broadband luminance and on the RGB one-shot color as well. So this is a very natural looking image. Don't get too caught up on astrophotography and really just stop to enjoy what you've taken a photo of because it is bizarre and inspiring and amazing and humbling all at once. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.